Watch this. It's been nearly a month since the state's largest school district went back to requiring all students and staff to mask up. But has it helped? His claims of election fraud in Idaho didn't sit well with state election officials, who quickly proved him wrong. Now, my pillow guy is going to have to possibly pay for his allegations. The sideways beer can, the giant airplane hanger, whatever you want to call it, the Kibbe Dome is celebrating a big milestone this weekend. But did you know that despite the weirdest college football stadium ranking by ESPN, it's actually quite the engineering feat. Well, just coming into our newsroom for you, former state representative Aaron Von Ellinger has just been booked into the Ada County Jail. He is charged with felony rape. Von Ellinger was originally arrested back on September 27th in Clayton County, Georgia, after departing an international flight. And that's where he's been for the last 11 days. But again, just within the last few minutes, we've learned he is now back in the state of Idaho. A little backstory for you. Jane Doe, a former State House staffer, alleged that Von Ellinger raped her back on a date in March. After a six month investigation, the Ada County Sheriff's Office issued an arrest warrant. Again, we are just learning more about the situation. We'll bring you the latest as it becomes available. Turning to this now, it's been a community conversation for as long as it seems now. What to do about masks? And that's been a major ongoing question specifically for Idaho schools. The largest district in the state, the West Ada School District, they've been a prime example of that conversation. In recent weeks and months, we've seen the district go in a few different directions with their policy. So let's set the stage here. At the very beginning of the school year, masks were required for West Ada students, teachers and staff. However, there was an opt out option. Parents just needed to sign a form saying that their student was opting out of the mask requirement. And you're looking at video of parents lined up outside the district office and then we went in to fill out all those forms. But all the situation actually drew a pretty quick comment from the community. How can you have a requirement if someone just opts out of it? It's not a requirement is what the community feedback has been to us. Well, about two weeks after that initial decision and as COVID cases surged in our community and hospitals eventually went to crisis standards of care statewide, West Data changed course saying that they would transition from a recommendation to a requirement. And here's how they got here. We're going to take a look at the COVID cases that really have been progressing since the beginning of the school year through now. And the blue lines you see is high schools in West Data, orange is middle school, and gray is elementary school. So on the far left is classes, or excuse me, cases from September 5th through the 11th. That's the week before the school district decided to require masks. The second set of bars you see here is the first week that masks were required. And you can see that cases did go down slightly across all schools and that continued to happen for the next two weeks. Now this week the data is un in incomplete. It's incomplete, I should say, but just to reiterate West Ada calculates their cases very differently than other school districts, so it can be hard to compare and contrast between districts. They only count cases of those who are infectious while attending school, but you can see there the bars did slightly go down after the mask policy. Now, the district initially said that they were going to require masks for two weeks until September 24th, but with cases and hospitalizations still rising, it was again renewed until today, October 8th. And just a short time ago, we found out the West Ada School District is now extending their mask requirement with no opt out. But until when? We don't know the answer for now, but what we do know is that the West Ada School District is going to hold a special school board meeting on October 13th, so next week. It's going to focus on COVID protocols moving forward and on indicators that will be used to make a decision on returning to a mask optional environment. I know a lot of you are following this at home as we head into the weekend, but we're going to keep everyone updated. And again, it will be discussed at a school board meeting on October 13th. Well, last week we told you about the 2020 election audit that the state of Idaho conducted after claims were recently made that all Idaho counties have their 2020 presidential election results altered digitally from nefarious powers. Now, those claims came from Mike Lindell. He's the CEO of My Pillow. So, yes, if you're wondering, he is the same person that does sell pillows and infomercials. He's also a staunch supporter of Donald Trump. Now, Lindell has publicly stated that votes cast for Trump in the last election were illegally changed to votes for President Joe Biden. He says that happened in Idaho. However, there's no evidence that this happened. Still, Lindell posted data that supposedly showed the proof, and that was shared with the Idaho Secretary of State's office. 
This is a major accusation saying that an entire state's election system has been breached. So the Secretary of State's office said we're going to look into it. Long story short, election officials went to three Idaho counties, Camas, Butte and Bonner, and they found no evidence or correlation to the claims made by Lindell. Story doesn't end there. Now the Secretary of State's office is working on sending Mike Lindell a bill for his audit. An audit done, they say, based on Lindell's claims. Some are calling them baseless claims that brought Idaho's election integrity into question. Again, this is not a light matter for the state. And the Secretary of State's office tells me that they are working to get an invoice ready, which should go out in about two weeks. Now, of note, I've seen this question asked. The audits that were done by the state of Idaho last week, they were actually paid for by a federal grant that Idaho got a few years back, and it was a grant for election-related costs. So, no, your Idaho tax dollars didn't pay for the audits, but in a roundabout way, your federal taxes from a few years ago we're in the pot, and that may have helped pay for the audit. It has been a long news week, so we're going to go back through our inbox and answer some of your most asked questions from the week. From COVID to the week that was with Idaho's leadership, we've got it all. And there's still time to get your questions and comments about the show into us. Text me right now. The number's on your screen, 208-321-5614. Be sure to include your name and hashtag the 208. We're going to share as many of these texts as we can on air at the end of the show. It's Friday, you made it through the week. And on Friday, besides hearing about your good news, we like to take the time to go back through our inbox and answer any of the questions we may have missed throughout this week. So let's get right to these. And of course, you can send them anytime. This from Rhonda who asks, has anyone heard any more about a Moderna booster shot? Well, the good news for you, Rhonda, both Moderna and Johnson & Johnson have both submitted requests for emergency youth authorizations for their booster shots. But as of right now, they are still not yet available. Now, only those who got the Pfizer vaccine and are older than 65 or have underlying medical conditions are eligible for the most part to get a booster shot. Now, that shot must come at least six months after a two dose series. The FDA is expected to meet next week to review Moderna and Johnson and Johnson data on the booster topic, but the CDC and the FDA would have to sign off on the decision. Our leaders at the Department of Health and Welfare say that they know it is being studied closely and they're hoping to learn more by the end of October. All right, another question for you. Can you give an update on the monoclonal sites available? No problem. So right now there are three state sponsored treat, excuse me, state state sponsored treatment centers. Two are now open, one in Idaho Falls, one in Coeur d'Alene. 32 hospitals across the state of Idaho are also offering the treatment, and that includes both San Alphonsus and St. Luke's. In most instances, you must test positive for COVID-19 and have a doctor's referral to receive these treatments. Make sure to talk with your doctor before seeking this treatment, and we should know that the treatment should not be used as an alternative to getting the vaccine, which is still the most effective guard against the virus. 
The monoclonal antibodies is supposed to keep COVID positive patients or those who have been exposed to COVID out of the hospital. Now, as of today, the monoclonal antibodies have been approved by the FDA under emergency use authorization, but have not yet received full FDA approval. Idaho medical experts tell us again, getting a vaccine is the best option. It is a better option than having to eventually get monoclonal antibodies. The COVID-19 vaccines are both safe and effective. All right, let's cover one more question for now. Brant asks, what about those contempt of court charges for the lieutenant governor? What became of those? Well, those are still in the works and a quick, a quick recap for you. Several media outlets requested documents from the lieutenant governor's education task force. Now earlier this year, she asked the public to submit their comments about the alleged indoctrination in our public school system. Now her office denied those record requests. So the Idaho Press Club sued her office and in a court of law, they won. A judge then ordered McGeehan to release those records, but she failed to do so initially. She eventually asked the judge to reconsider his decision, but that was denied. That is until last week when the Idaho Press Club asked the judge to hold her in contempt of court for not complying with the order. One day later, the Lieutenant Governor did release those documents, but she still is scheduled to appear in front of a judge next Wednesday, at which point the judge could decide to hold her in contempt for not initially complying with his order. College football's weirdest stadium, about seven hours north from here, is the heart of the Palouse. Tomorrow, it celebrates its 50th anniversary. You ever wonder Joe Vandal has to say about this? I wouldn't want to mess with that guy. Grab your phones. Last call to text us your questions and comments about the show. You know the number. It's 208-321-5614. Make sure to include your name and hashtag the 208. We're going to get to a few of these at the end of the show.
definitely a beautiful sunset. And as we look out there this evening, not quite the same for tonight. Showers are starting to decrease, but we could still see some lighter showers and sprinkles around for this evening. I'll show you why coming up here in just a second. But the winds tomorrow, even though we have sunshine, keep in mind that the winds will get kind of breezy from about noon to four, even six o'clock into the evening. And you know, when you see some gusts up there around 30 to 25 miles an hour, I think you're going to notice that. So that's that's uh, noon to about six o'clock tomorrow. Now the temperatures, you've been hearing a lot about this. The overnight lows getting so cold next Tuesday and Wednesday, and there's possibility of frost, but they do come up after that, okay? So it's not over with entirely. And when you look at the 10-day uh, trend for highs, you see the beginning of next week, right around 50, but toward the end of the week, here's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, okay? So at least we've got temperatures in the 60s. Doesn't look like it's gonna be in the 80s. The amount of rain today is quite a bit. We had about a, uh, almost a third of an inch of rain, about, uh, about a quarter of an inch in, in Meridian. Out here to the west, they had a little more that was showing here, but still just lighter amounts. More of the heavier rain came up from the south toward Twin Falls and from Boise eastward. Now, temperature-wise, it kept the temperatures down because of the overcast. So you see 61, 65 for Ontario. In Twin Falls, 56 degrees for the high temperature. As you look at this satellite map, here's most of the moisture here ready to push to the east, but there's still some showers out here to our southwest, so we'll see that for tonight. Uh, showers and twin falls up around Sun Valley as well. I'll provide you with a wider shot as this continues to swing through. We start to dry up tonight before this next storm system comes in on Sunday. So when I say dry up, there'll be some scattered showers around until about oh, 1 to 2 o'clock tomorrow morning, and then it dries up. That's going to form some fog in the morning. So you're going to see some fog in most all locations tomorrow because of the saturation of the soil. Temperature wise, highs will be into the 50s for the Magic Valley. That's it. Same thing for the Central Mountains. You're going to have some rain overnight and then the possibility of some snow on Monday morning. It doesn't look like it's heavy, but the same thing for Stanley. A possibility for McCall, but take a break tomorrow. Uh, sunshine during the day tomorrow. Down here in Valley locations, highs will mainly be into the mid 60s. Uh, you see that for Boise too, low to mid 60s, 63. Seymour rating was 63, CUNA with a high temperature of 63 degrees. Next seven days, well, you notice that there's the morning fog, then the sunshine increases to partly cloudy. Temperature will be 63 tomorrow. Now Sunday, increasing clouds, uh, scattered showers, probably more Sunday evening. Uh, Monday morning, still a chance of a few scattered showers around. See 36 for Monday morning, Tuesday as it clears out 34 and the same thing for Wednesday. Not only cold, that means that there could be some areas of frost in some of those locations. Uh, Thursday and Friday, we start pushing this temperature up uh, to where we're getting pretty close to 60 degrees. By the end of next week, you saw the 10 day temperature trend. It will be starting to warm up just a bit right after this, Joe. Well, we are smack in the middle of college football season. Here's some numbers for you. The Boise State Broncos are two and three. The Idaho Vandals are 0 oh and four. And to add insult to all of this, yesterday ESPN called the Kibbe Dome at the University of Idaho college football's weirdest stadium. Hmm, okay. Well, Bronco fans may agree, but for the Vandals, it's not weird. It's home. And it's been home for almost 50 years. On October 9th, 1971, the first Vandal football game was played in the Kibbe Dome, which technically wasn't a dome yet. The Palouse Pea Palace, the Valhalla, the Hap Moody Dome, all names the University of Idaho considered for its state-of-the-art football stadium back in 1975. But as we all know, money talks. So after William Kibbe, a student who attended the University of Idaho for just a few weeks in 1936, well, when he donated $300,000 to its construction, the Kibbe Dome was born. But that facility wouldn't even begin to take shape until 1971. Well before that, the Vandals actually played outside at Neal Stadium, which opened in 1937. Named after University of Idaho President Mervyn Neal, it was where Vandal great Jerry Kramer would go on to play for the Green Bay Packers and win Super Bowls one and two. Well, that's where Kramer played his college football. And for nearly three decades, it was used for Vandal football and later it was the home site for the Vandal track team. It featured wooden bleachers and wooden scoreboard, so I'm guessing aerial fireworks weren't a big feature on game day. A few years after Kramer graduated in 1958, ideas to build a new stadium started to surface as Neal Stadium began to crumble like a cookie. In 1968, it was actually condemned because of soil erosion. Underneath the grandstands, things didn't look good. 
The whole thing, though, was ultimately destroyed by a fire in 1969. The wood infrastructure is not a great match with fire. So the Vandals actually used Washington State's field as their own home field for the time being. And it was around that time that rumors swirled of a possible joint stadium between the University of Idaho and Washington State, whose campuses are just six miles and one border apart from each other. As you may already know, those rumors would forever just be that, rumors. And construction did begin on the Vandal Kibbe Dome in 1971. The original design called for 20 to 30,000 seats, but the whole thing was eventually scaled down to 16,000. Stage one opened on October 9, 1971 as just a concrete and grass stadium with press boxes and grandstands. Stage two, completed in 1972, included artificial turf. And in 1974, the 400 foot barrel arch roof made of beams of laminated wood on tubular shaped steel was installed along with vertical end walls all of it, of course, totally tubular. From turf to roof, it stands 144 feet tall, or about 12 stories, which is about half of the full Statue of Liberty in New York City. And those end walls were littered with yellow and brown dots, which represented the computer-generated fight song. That was eventually replaced in 2011 with the state-of-the-art light-transmitting panels. In 1975, the 93,000-square-foot enclosed stadium opened to the public. In all, the total cost was over $12 million. Despite its behind-the-back nicknames like the Airplane Hangar, the Giant Sideways Beer Can, it earned the Outstanding Structural Engineering Achievement Award in 1976. And for vandals in the state of Idaho, it always will be Home Sweet Dome. Home Sweet Dome. Since it was completed, the Kibbe Dome has undergone several renovations like expanded locker rooms and training rooms, the original turf, which was called Magic Carpet, because it was certainly magic, it was replaced with the AstroTurf in 2007. And good news for Vandal fans, the University of Idaho will soon have another state-of-the-art facility right next door. Take a look at this. The $51 million ICCU Arena is just north of the Kibbe Dome. It broke ground back in 2019, and the one-of-a-kind wood structure highlights Idaho's wood products industry. How about this? All the lumber used in construction was actually cut and harvested in the state of Idaho. The arena features 4,000 seats and will be the new home for the Vandal basketball programs beginning this season. So go check them out there. Before we go to break, a very quick feel good Friday. I think we all deserve it. Let's head into the weekend with some puppy video. Everyone, this is a big moment. I want you to meet Mo.
All right, here is your reminder that we are not just on your television. Oh, no, no, we exist beyond that. We're all over the place, including social media. So please connect with us after hours, 208 After Dark. You can see us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, we're everywhere. Now feel free to send us an email. You can leave us a voicemail at the Channel 7 voicemail line because we know how much you guys love to hear those. And if you miss any of our 208 shows, I mean any of them at all, they are all available right now on the YouTube page. And I can tell you that our great web team, they get the full episodes uploaded very quickly after we go off the air. And speaking of going off the air, let's do that with some, some comments here. This one from Karen, hashtag the 208. A lot of people have learned biology this year, vax or anti. That is true. We have learned a lot about biology, but remember there are experts and then there are those of us that read comments on social media. So it's a disclaimer there. Uh, I agree with billing the pillow guy. There should be consequences for making baseless claims. Jim in Boise. Yes. Well, when the state of Idaho is charged with possibly having a illegitimate election, that's a really big deal. So the secretary of state's office looked into it. It was a baseless claim. That's their idea. There was no evidence to support it. So yeah, they want some, they want some money for their time and effort. Hashtag the 208. The only problem I have with your show, it is too short. You cover some great topics and I appreciate it. Thank you. And this is the part I like about the message. Shout out to all of our hero nurses and doctors and staff. That's from Bob. Bob, thank you for the kind message. Final one for you. This one from Vicky. Might have missed it, but where is Brian? Saw him report at the fire. That is true. Brian did go report at the fire and then he headed out of town. Brian's going to be gone for a little bit. He's happy and healthy, just taking time away. So it'll be me. And I'll see you on Monday, and we're going to get into a lot of the great stuff that Brian gets into. So send us your comments. Have a great weekend. We will see you all on Monday. Mo, Mo, you're the best. We'll see you soon.